Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode 138 of Arsenal Pass. Hayden Dow here with Brennan Patrick. Podcast, speaking of podcast, Brennan Patrick, we're, we're doing a podcast today on how to build a successful testing team. But first of all, I want to shout out, how has your week been? You're obviously, you know, you're, you've been back for a week and a bit now. Uh, I'm back in Australia as of last, uh, yesterday. It's good to be home, honestly, three weeks of travel. I don't, how do you feel about travel? Like, do you enjoy traveling? Like, I'm I'm getting pretty over it, I'll usually, be honest. Yeah, yeah, usually, but I'm over it now because I was traveling before the World Championships and I was doing like, I don't know. So I went to California uh, with my girlfriend and then we did this thing where we drove kind of like all over the place and that sucked ass. I'm not going to lie. I, I hate being in the car. I hate driving. Like, it's just not my thing. So when, when most of that trip was dominated by that and then I got... You know, we flew over to Barcelona. I was pretty sick. I mentioned last podcast, I was like, I have this auto mm. autoimmune disease and I was very ill for pretty much all of Barcelona and the flight back was an absolute beat down as a result. So yeah, I'm done. I feel, it feels great to be home. Like it feels fantastic. I'm so happy to be home and be able to kind of just chill and do what I want and get normal sleep. Cause yeah, it was a, it was definitely a blitz there for a bit. It was funny, Hayden. I saw this, this comment in one of our podcasts, last podcast, which was definitely a positive oriented podcast, but I guess we gave some feedback and someone was like, someone was like, wow, you guys get to travel the world and you're complaining, get humbled. And I'm like, does this person not think that we spend our own fucking money to like travel to these? Like, this is insane, bro. Like, I, like, I was so surprised by this comment, to be honest, because like, I was like, oh, it was a great experience. The flight back was a little, sucked a little bit. And they're like, Wow, what a piece of shit. I'm like, okay. <laughs> nice. Nice. Ah, it's all good. It's all good. Like, it is. I mean, I just flew 24 hours. And oh, actually, honestly, my flight wasn't too bad. I got a little bit lucky. Had a seat free next to me. You know, all the, all the kind of head in, head in the check That has never happened uh, to me, bro. What the hell? Is that like an Australian yeah. thing? Like, when you fly to Australia, seats are open? Because when you fly to America, it's like the opposite. Like, you, you don't even have overhead room to be on. Like, you have to check all your Yeah, bags. well, US internal flights are horrendous honestly yeah and, and a lot of flights to the us they they like to just can well they don't need to get aircraft to places because there's so many like hubs right so it's a little bit different to the rest of the world where they've got to get aircrafts back especially if you're in australia you can't just leave an aircraft in australia and cancel a flight yeah so. i think i'm done um, flying american by the way I've, fl- I've flown american my entire life because my family flew when i was a kid right. and i guess that was my go-to i swear to god i swear to god tinfoil hat they have somehow made those seats smaller. I know that. Of course, they have. Technically, I've <laughs> probably gotten bigger since 15 years ago. Maybe I've grown a bit, but holy crap! I flew Iberia from um, the US to Spain. Oh yeah. Oh my god! Like that was very good, yeah. luxurious. Like so much room, so much room for activities. And I get on this American flight, and holy shit, it was ter- it was so stuffy and cramped. And um, on my way over, uh, yeah. Actually, on my way back, I was in a double middle. So you know how they have the three, yeah, yeah, the yeah, four, in the, in the middle. Oh, God. Three, four, three. So you're in the middle of the airplane, and they're in the middle of the four. Man, choose your seats, dude. Choose your seats. They, this is why this I is, did. No. I did, and then they freaking swapped it last minute. And I called them. And they told me to, I could go f myself. And I was like, thanks. That's great. That's great. So that was so fun. that's American Airlines for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Don't fly. Don't fly American. I flew Qatar. Qatar. Yeah, I mean, flood, so. all all of those like. All those airlines are so much better, to be honest. Like, I, I don't know why I thought American was like American has a uh, a HUD in DFW, by the way. Um, so that's kind of like yeah. that's what makes it easier. But I've just been flying them my whole life, and I've never really th- my only experiences are things like Spirit, where it's like, yeah, of course that one sucks. But um, yeah, now that I'm branching off a little bit, I flew a little bit of Turkish, Iberian. It's, it's so much better, bro. It's so much better. What's your like, before we jump onto the news? What's your number one travel tip for Flesh and Mod players heading to events in this next year? Oh, um, for me, uh, and this is something because I used to travel from the US to Asia like every winter and every summer um, and you know, other places in Europe for whatever reason. Uh, the number one thing is that you take a night flight on the way there. And then if you, if you can sleep on flights, I am now physically incapable. Now that I'm close to 30 years old. I cannot do it. But when I could, you take a night flight to Europe or Asia, you sleep on the way there and you'll, it's way better, way better for the jet lag. To be honest, because like yeah, the last thing like, that's want- just a unicorn. That's the unicorn if you can sleep on, honestly. There, unaided, unaided. Can. If you can sleep unaided. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, on the flight back, I mean, the guys next to me were like, there, there's like some bros sitting like across from me, and they were all just talking about like their their ambient experience on the flight back. And it's like, bro, people are wild to take that. And who knows if you wake up, what you'll be up to. All right. Let's get into the news this week, and uh, I mean, there's some there's some big news on the Living Legend front. The Living Legend change that was implemented a few weeks ago prior to the World Championships, which now sees a weekly Living Legend check, has definitely already spiced things up. Uh, we're closing out the skirmish season, and we've had not one, not two, 
that three heroes have Living Legend Brennan we've had. Chain, first of all, hit Living Legend mm. last week, so it was ineligible for the last week of Skirmish. And then with following this last week of Skirmish, uh, Season 8, I think we're up to, uh, Kasai and Kano both hit Living Legend, which honestly kind of seems crazy to me because I think, you know, I want to ask your opinion on losing Kano, obviously, but Chain, we know, has been sort of a pretty much a top dog in this format or one of the top dogs in this format since since Viscerai Living Legend um, and, and to an extent Kano but Kasai is honestly the one that kind of surprised me a little bit but the Living Legend cap is, is so low we're going to see heroes Living Legend at a rapid pace through these uh, these skirmish seasons and I wonder I'm starting to think now like what is the future of Blitz in terms of competitive play like is is actually we're going to see like because of the shake up this format we're going to see Blitz implemented into a few things I like a Blitz team calling is the thing I want more than anything mm -hmm. uh, and I think with the new Living Legend changes that's the kind of format that would really lend itself to I guess what we've seen with these changes, you know, like a rapidly changing format, a format that incorporates, you know, teamwork to basically find three decks at any given time at a life cycle of a, of a Blitz format that's super fast. But I don't know, any thoughts on that? And then I'll ask you about Kano, obviously. Um, any thoughts on Blitz? I mean, I would vastly prefer the Pro Tours and World Championships to be, if, they, if they're they're headstrong on dual format. I prefer it to be Blitz and Class Constructed. I just don't like. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, dude. I hate draft at the. Pro you Tour. can't crown a world champion without. Uh, no, you that's can't. the thing. It's like there's this opinion where it's like, well, I'm gonna make the best. Play. Well, you know what? You can have that. I don't even care. I'm not even gonna argue on that angle. I just don't like it. I don't like it. it it's a, it shakes it up too much. I'd rather focus on. Const I just it actually just irritates me at this point. But it's just an opinion, and it's okay if I have a different opinion than you um, on dual format Pro Tours. But I would take Blitz over Draft. Um, what do I think about the Blitz format and it rotating? Probably makes it more fun, to be honest. Uh, more interesting. Uh, more mm -hmm. chances to sort of shake the meadow up if a competitive event does come around, which I don't know if it will. And uh, I guess I'll answer your second question because I saw this in the notes, Aiden, and I was thinking about it. And my answer really sucks, to be honest, because <laughs> what do I think about Kano, um, Living Legend, and Blitz? I don't care, dude. I wish I did, but I don't because I'm not going to play Blitz. Uh, I have no plans to play Blitz. There's no competitive events to play Blitz. So I just don't care at this point. If there was a Blitz team calling and Kanan wasn't available, would it, would it be less fun for me? Sure. I mean, I'd probably prefer to play that deck, but ultimately, uh, you know, just kind of like ships in the night. Like it's just like it, Kano's gone, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. like all, all I'm really focused on at this point is I'm on my competitive arc again and I'm just, I'm just going for the next pro tour. Uh, next two pro tours in the world championship this year no more casting no more of that shit no more pretending i you know i care about blitz or anything like i'm just trying to you know place well at these tournaments um i don't know i've just sort of turned the corner there i so i don't really care what do you think about kato living legend dude this guy's on his villain arc i tell you always turning heel <laughs> <laughs> i i mean I, I really like blitz i mean they've definitely like Flip. i haven't played many games i I might not have even played a game of Blitz since the Blitz since the World Championship last year, and I, that I, I wish I had. Like I wish I had played more Blitz, but there just hasn't been the opportunity to. There hasn't been events. A uh, sort of armories in my area tend to either be draft, which I want to go and play draft as much as possible, or they're going to be class constructed. So there has been. I mean, there, there are Blitz. To be fair, there are Blitz. I just haven't haven't been to those as much, and they've been a tougher times for me. But you know, I'd love to see another a team calling with Blitz is like very high on my list probably might be number one on my list of things i'd love to see in 2024 uh but you know the other thing i would like to see is is blitz used in a, in a progress format to be honest and like that might not be the right thing that might not be the right thing for competitive integrity of the game but i think it would be fun i i just i think it would be fun at least to do maybe a blitz slash class constructed season so you know like maybe 30 to 40 percent of progress of blitz 60 to 70 are class constructed like that might be a way to balance it out i think it makes a little bit less sense potentially than doing like a blitz slash limited, but I understand the thoughts and feelings on on sealed, so it needs to be a draft um, pro quest season, which they've done. But yeah, ultimately, I, I actually I actually want more blitz, and I kind of feel in terms of Kano, like I'm excited. I'm excited. Kano's been, I mean, the very first skirmish I ever went to, skirmish season one, I played Kano at. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm I'm glad that we're kind of moving through that, and we're eight seasons into skirmish, and Kano, we finally say goodbye to, uh, and it shakes it up, right? Like. There is now, so Iceland is Living Legend in Blitz, Kano is Living Legend. We still have Emperor though, and Emperor is actually a deck I'm kind of excited to play around with now that Kano's gone, I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I just wondered, is because Blitz has this massive inventory slot, so are, people still, are they still prepared for any form of arcane damage? I mean, the Emperor can play the wizard cards, right? Uh, but you just play cards now, right? So you might be sorting out some cards for aggro or some cards mm -hmm. inside out for your defense reactions if you have to go proactive, right? So I don't know. It's so interesting. I guess he's relevant 
you know, he's relevant. Is he the last he's like real- legit source of arcane damage left in the Bliss format? No, you still have uh, Vincent. Oh, okay, yeah, Vincent. Um, um, so yeah, let's. Uh, I mean, Blitz. Interesting. I yeah, like I say, top of my list is some more Blitz events for twenty twenty four. We'll see. I I do think this kind of change in implementation to the Living Legend system creates space for Alice's to do that. So we'll, we'll see kind of what they decide. Obviously, we know the Pro Tour schedule for next year. We don't know about Worlds yet, um, and we don't know about a whole host of callings. Let's talk about Class Constructed though, because the I guess the one that maybe we should lead with is Iceland hit Living Legend over the weekend. We had Battle Hardened and uh, where was the Battle Hardened? It was in Belgium, right? So. And Icelander took out the battle heart and, and ascended to Living Legend. You know, came came very close to the World Championship. Obviously, Fi uh, in the hands of Alex defeating uh, Shing in the finals on Icelander, and then Icelander takes it one week further and then runs it out. And we're going to head into twenty twenty four. We're going to head into this Pro Quest season. I think that's the first thing we head into, right? For Amsterdam, uh, with with no Living uh, with no Icelander. Sorry. Yeah, so that's the actual sad one. <laughs> I mean, the game changes dramatically. I, I don't know yeah, if it's I'm excited. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's for the best to be honest, because you can no longer be punished for running like mono reds in your deck. Um, but I liked Icelander. I liked the playstyle of Icelander. I liked what threat it had on the meta game. Um, how it made people put cards into their deck. I mean, people uh, Kano's more playable as Icelander loses the format. I'll tell you that infinitely mm-hmm. more playable um, because for now sure. it's a legit opportunity cost to put arcane uh, arcane barrier into your deck. And uh, Kane is one of Kane's worst matchups as Icelander. So, I mean, that that side is good, yeah. but Icelander was a really fun deck to play. I really enjoyed that deck, and I enjoyed the play style of it. And it's it's sad to see it go. I, but I know people, their initial reaction, a lot of people whose decks may have been suppressed by Frostbites and Ice are very happy. We'll see how that uh, ends up playing out, though. Yeah, it's interesting. You said you don't get punished for playing mono reds in your deck, but maybe, maybe you want to expand on that a little bit? Because, I'm, yeah, what, what do you mean by that? So no longer do you have to deal with this threat of the Frostbite. Like these Jermai decks were adding in blues to specifically tech against the Icelander decks. I mean, the Phi decks lost significant equity against Icelander as Belittle was rotate, was banned out of the format. Um, and I think you can just build these aggro decks more redline without the threat of Icelander. Icelander being one of the most popular and most played decks. Obviously, Kano competes on a similar axis to uh, threatening those decks and their lack of resources but i mean honestly one of the best ways to beat kano is to just play the most aggro deck possible and then kano just won't have it a uh, significant um significant i wouldn't say majority of the time but a significant time to where it's it's irrelevant so yeah i think that ice rotating out changes deck building in flesh and blood i agree yeah yeah. and i i think i don't know whether you sit on the i guess you you say you don't know right what that means to the game you're not sure where you sit yeah i think i sit optimistic side of it like i think it's going to really change the way that players are allowed to deck build and mm. does that mean it's maybe too positive for dromai like you kind of alluded to maybe and you know that might be the kind of downside of it is that dromai's get to get away with being you know almost potentially fully red line but what i think it does open up is other aggressive decks to potentially um be a bit more creative with the way they're deck building you know um be a bit more ninjas in particular like katsu is a deck that i think gets super punished for drawing all red hands regardless of ice uh frost bites but now maybe there's some room for zero costs and yeah different ways to look at building the decks i think i'm also optimistic i just remember the last i mean it's such a different meta but the last time icelander was like less relevant in the game um it's it's weird because ice was always kind of relevant but i mean i think about pt2 that's kind of a meta where icelander was suppressed by prism and we saw mm-hmm. like this aggro meta and it was probably the least fun i ever had playing class construct <laughs> in, in flesh and blood yeah. at a competitive event and like aggro like aggro in general should get better from this chain like from from icelander leaving aggro in general should be better and um it's just not a it's not a play style that I have an affinity towards that I sort of gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. Obviously, aggro as a title Agreed. in Flesh and Blood is is weird, you know, like does it actually exist? But um, you know, these decks like the hyper aggressive Phi decks or the, like the Briar decks of PT Leo, those are not the decks I like to play. And I think those decks are the ones that get significantly better with Icelander leaving the format. So does Kano though. So yeah, I mean Kano, Kano gets <laughs> Kano gets so much better. Kano gets So does Bravo? Yeah. But the thing about Kano, and I'm not gonna riff on this Your too boy much. Bravo. Yeah, boy Bravo, definitely. My boy Bravo gets so yeah. much better. Bravo might actually be a playable deck now. Probably might actually be the best deck in the game, um, which is hilarious. But the thing about Kano nowadays in Modern Flesh and Blood is that the like the increase in reds and the, the the decrease in resource cards and this now this opportunity cost of Arcane Barrier, it's actually like not as significant as it would have been in the past because they printed so many cards that just inherently hate 
on what Kano's trying to do with the combo, like mm. access to um, uh, Oasis Respite, Sand Cover, uh, Spell Void for some classes. Like those cards really neuter Kano, and they don't punish the players that deck build in a way that Kano should be able to exploit, which is maybe a good thing. I mean, Kano's a toxic deck. I'll give you that. But oh yeah, although Kano does get better, he still is going to face the same problems he did before. But nevertheless, uh, debatably, <laughs> Kano's worst matchup in the game has not left. All right, let's uh, wrap up the, the Living Legend kind of chat. So yeah, Icelander Stormbind is now hit Living Legend as of uh, December 1st. And of course, Signature Weapon going with that. I was like, oh, okay, that's if I lose- bad, that's, that's a big deal. I lose, I lose Wanny Moon. Yeah, that's a big no, deal. No, I don't. Oh, you no, don't? Kraken's Aether Vein. <laughs> Kraken's Aether Vein is the Signature Weapon that goes. What? <laughs> Wanny Moon remains, so, which is very interesting for deck building with Kano, I think. So Icelander Stormbind and her Signature Weapon, Kraken's Aether Vein, are gone. Remember, because that Kraken's Aether Vein came with the original yeah. young Icelander. Who the, exactly. who the fuck would have got that trivia question? Like, what is the Icelander's signature weapon? Who would have said Kraken's Aether Vein? Oh my god, I totally forgot. Okay, yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah, Waning okay. Moon went a bit a big knock to Wizard in general, but that's huge. Okay, yeah. I, I legitimately yeah, thought so that powerful. was the weapon. <laughs> uh, Blitz, uh, but Kano does go in Blitz and takes Crucible Aether Weave with it in Blitz, and then mm. Kasai takes uh, Centauri Sabers with it in as well. And then, of course, uh, Chain, we you know hit last week, we didn't get a chance to, to talk about it because we recorded quite early uh, as we needed to. Seeds of Agony and Soul Reaping unbanned, uh, by the way, in uh, Blitz, or unsuspended, sorry. And um, Chain takes Galaxy Black with it. And then also unbanned in Class Constructed is Amulet of Ice and Hypothermia, well, unsuspended. Mm. Um, I think that's that's all the changes, yeah. Galaxy Black, how funny is it that these two super powerful heroes have these ass weapons attached to them? And like, you would think Chain, and you would think like, I don't know, uh, Nebula Blade, or of course, Rosetta Thorn. Uh, but it's actually Galaxy Black. You think Iceland, you think Waning Moon, but it's actually Kraken's Aether Vein. It's funny how that works. Yeah. It would be interesting if Briar Living Legend before Chain to see what would happen to Chain without Rosetta Thorn in that format. But anyway, I digress. Uh, let's move on. Commander Cookout. Doing something a little bit different in Commander Cookout this week, right, Brennan? Do you want to introduce that and, and take it away? Yeah, so we have comments from YouTube. I mean, if you want to you get your comment, question, statement read out on the um, next week's podcast, she has a comment on YouTube. Um, but the first one here comes from Corey Sydney. Is this Corey from Sydney, Australia or Corey Sydney? Yeah. Okay. I thought this was like a name. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> let, let me, let me, where am I, where am I to see this? <laughs> anyway. All right. And the first one here is from Kai 303. They say definitely was a blast overall referring to the world championship or the side events. Say surely Friday was a bit chaotic with the registration for CC Sagrada and everything. But as I only wanted to play CC, it was not that big of a problem for me. On Saturday, I then played the calling, went 0-4 and dropped. After that, I was after that I was playing the Sagrada CC in round three. I got paired against you, Hayden. Um, I was not into podcasts that much before, but subscribe now, of course. Great content, both of you. So your name sounded familiar. But I just could not match it at the moment. I was like, wait a minute, I know that name. My friends then enlightened me and I was thrilled to play against you. I really enjoyed playing against a top level player like you uh, with such a nice down to earth attitude. That was definitely one of the highlights of our weekend. So thank you for that. Well, thank you Kai for the positive comment. A rarity in today's world. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a nice game. I, I remember uh, meeting Kai actually. Kai was the Kai was on Dash. We played in the Sagrada event. Don't, I also went one uh, one three drop in the in the calling Kai. So uh, don't feel bad about that. It was uh, it was great to play you. Thanks for nice to meet you as well. Yeah. Next one here is from Stantu. They say amazing overall, uh, amazing event overall. But the Friday team sealed event took six hours to run, and we only got to play three uh, three out of four games. We were supposed to due to massive delays and some gem uh, problems. Apparently, no compensation was given to players, and this made me miss a constructed event on the afternoon. Yeah, so that I obviously I didn't get to experience this, but I heard secondhand um, some of the tournament issues that were going on. I also know about some other issues that people have no idea occurred, which is there was a lot of back end stuff like panels and like tons of stuff planned, all mm -hmm. got scrapped. Didn't happen. Basically, there was like no microphones from what I understand, like in the event. So so much like uh, actual content with I think like James developers. All that kind of stuff just got totally scrapped. So, I mean, I mean, I'll be the first one to say it. The the world's event and the like, the professional side event went pretty smooth. Uh, I mean, flesh and blood yeah. events are kind of at that point. This level, the judging staff is much very very good nowadays, um, and things go pretty smooth. But tournament center. 
definitely dropped the ball on this event. Uh, I mean, especially in the side events, the Sagrada de Familia. And all, I mean, Hayden and I talked about it. The compensation for Sagrada, the Sagrada Familia with the, uh, the Sigil of Solace. My opinion, I think the opinion of a lot of people as well, probably should have put that in the Kali. <laughs> probably should have put that one in the Kali. Um, but I digress. Overall, it didn't make the weekend bad or anything. But uh, yeah, they could definitely improve from the uh, tournament tournament running side of things. <sighs> It's so tough because, like, I did say that to you, and that was something I really harped on about the the promo, the Sagrada promo, mm. promo, sigil promo being something they could have tied to the calling. Uh, but I think I thought about it more right over the week, mm. and it's like if they if they do that, can they also use it for side events? Like, is that is that fair? Is that a good way to do it? I, I don't know. It's a really tough one, but I think ultimately, probably the right decision was probably just here's the marquee promo, put it in the the main event, right? The calling, the main open event, but um. Yeah. Also, I did hear that there was an event that also had some issues. And to tournament center's credit, I did hear that people were given a buy for the last round, so everyone effectively got an extra win for tickets. Wise, uh, I'm not sure what event that was, but yeah, I did hear some positive in terms of the issues and the compensation. Yeah, I'm definitely very biased because tournament center royally pissed me off at this event because they totally fucked me over. Um, I digress. <laughs> Next one is from Thordu. They say, first time turning it, tuning into the Fab World Championship. The audio is so bad, I turn it off immediately. They need production company. Holy hell. Well, this is probably not the nicest comment, but I think it's important to read out because uh, they did have a production company, but also they were aware. We were aware this was going on, um, and everybody knew it was uh, unacceptable audio quality on day one, day two, day three. Not great, but salvageable. So uh, we, I say we as like a possessive plural uh but they we were aware of this issue it's unfortunate that it happened oh, the best thing they can do is you know take some lessons learned from this and make sure it never happens again um it's a pretty easy fix right i mean if we just done some testing it would have been pretty easy uh just unfortunately that's how it went and you just gotta learn your lesson and move on and be better next time so yeah so i haven't i haven't watched back much of the coverage yet and to be fair the coverage i've watched it was like in places so I, I had it on mute unfortunately i like i haven't watched back a lot of the coverage what like why could this not have been fixed between day one and day two like if this so is an it, audio it did get fixed. issue that's the problem so it got okay, it got okay. it got fixed right um like it was terrible on day one so we we're using like right, lapel okay. mics they were catching like both play, both uh commentators audios like lapel mics in general not what you should be using much. fine it, for solo yeah, like yeah, you know walking around you can't sit but, right yeah. next to someone i mean it's just got to yeah. be balanced um Anyway, they did they did fix it. it. The problem is it was still bad. Like, uh, and uh, yeah. So the thing is, is like I think that when it comes to a production, your casters can be mid to bad. Your your graphics can be mid to bad. Your video quality can be mid to bad. But if your auto mm -hmm. quality is bad, it's an instant turn off. Like, I mean, you just can't do it. Like, it's 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 so jarring and so. It, it makes it hard to watch. So it's unfortunate that happened. Like I said, everybody was aware of it. Unfortunately, they were aware of it too late. And I, I just, I, I'm pretty sure it will never happen again because it was definitely not, it was not a win. I'll say that. It was not a win on the we audio so. side. Um, I mean, I'll say if the, if the video is worse than the audio, I'm, I'm shutting it off because I can mute the audio, but I, I need to be able to see what's going on. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, is like when it comes to the audio and stuff like that, it's mostly for, I mean, the target audience is not the pro player that can mute. Cause yeah, of course, of honestly, course. most, I'll tell you right now. Most pro players don't listen to commentary. They mute it. Um, that's just how it is. <laughs> so it's going to get muted either way, even if it was great audio. Sometimes you won't. But the new player, the person who's like, oh, the Flesh and Blood World Championship is going on. What is Flesh and Blood? Let me go tune in and see. That's the player that you really want to kind of suck in. And when they when they get that audio, it's pretty bad. So like this person said, you know, they had never first time tuning in. And so, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but... I know that that point was hit home after, <laughs> and mm -hmm. there, there, there was a, definitely a retrospective on those audio issues, so I'm sure it will be better in the future, to be honest. Like, I can almost guarantee it. Yep. Anyway. Well, thanks for that, Brennan. Uh, like Brennan says, if you want to, you know, get your opinions heard, your questions read, I mean, we still, uh, this is still the Commander Cookout, so questions are more than welcome. Please get them in. We will continue to, you know, take some questions, and there'll be sometimes longer format questions, right, where we want to dive into and, and really answer. So we'll kind of take those as they come. You can get those in on the YouTube comments. You can email us at arsenalpassfab at gmail.com. You can tweet at us if you like. If you're an Arsenal Pass uh, patron, you can also drop in the Discord, and there is a channel in there for you to drop your Commander Cookout questions. With all that said, Brennan, let's get on to the main topic of the pod, and we're talking about testing groups for events, how to build a testing group. And this actually comes from 
this is a kind of a build on something that we've talked previously about, which is around, you know, how, how to kind of effectively test, but we talked about kind of the process of testing, right? Like, what does it mean? The ins and outs, the way to build gauntlets and all this kind of thing. But beyond that, I had a question that came through uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually from a, a local here in, in Australia and Sydney, um, who, you know, is kind of in that realm of grinding, trying to improve and, and looking at ways to build testing groups, right? And the question was, what advice do you give to people who want to get better, but don't have access to the Hayden and Nick's to grow from with, uh, to grow with from a testing level up perspective. Um, that's from Corey here in Sydney. So I think it's a great question. That kind of led me to, I think, you know, what we're going to talk about today, Brendan, which is how to make, uh, how to build a successful testing team. And I guess the first question I actually want to ask you is, does the size of the team matter? <laughs> I don't know why it's a funny question to me, but uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, I think that both and <laughs> teams of many different sizes all come with their own problems, right? Uh, the big teams, like too many cooks in the kitchen, uh, you can have misaligned values. I think that having aligned values and having sort of a core goal that you stay focused on is probably the, one of the most important things to being successful. Mm -hmm. And the small teams are as well. They can get a bit I mean, I don't know if this word is appropriate, but I think it's like it, they use the word inbred for testing. Um, like the testing mm -hmm. group, they just kind of reinforce bad ideas, basically. Yeah, and reiterate, iterate on the same things. They've been testing for the same amount of weeks. And yeah. Yep. And I mean, that could happen in a big group, too. If you don't have that sort of divergent person who's going to go against the, the group's opinion, then it's pretty, I mean, even that, that could even happen in a big group. Um, so yeah, when it comes to a testing team size, I don't think that there is an appropriate size. Uh, the smaller your team is, in general, the more work you're going to have to do. Um, and I think that in modern flesh and blood, it does behoove you to have a larger testing team rather than like a very, very small testing team. So back in the day, I would be totally comfortable with a two-person testing team. We have four heroes. We have eight heroes to deal with. It's not that much. Nowadays, there's a lot to deal with. The game is complicated. People are better. So it actually really helps to have people that specialize in certain heroes or in certain archetypes. Um, so you can kind of divide the work mm -hmm. in the beginning to sort of laser in on the few decks that you want to work together on as a group. Yeah, I also think information is a big part of that, which we'll, we'll kind of dive into, like the information available to you as a testing group. Um, obviously, the bigger your testing group is, the more people are going to generally, probably, likely be out talking to other people, bring back ideas. And I think we've kind of moved beyond this, you know, PT1, PT2, even more championships last year, I would say in, in callings, for instance, I'd say groups were like fairly siloed, groups stayed like pretty tight, pretty uh, in-house. I would say that has, because of just the nature of this game being a hero-centric game and because of I guess the the complexity of this game one person's opinion on something is it can often be vastly different to someone else's and the way that people play games as a hero versus how someone else in the hero plays games or their experiences can be vastly different and you can't get in enough games on any one hero within a short period of time to master it so i think people have been more open to uh discourse amongst groups so between groups between other players uh they might be operating solo but within a testing group and discussing with a wide variety of players and we've seen that happen a lot more over the last couple of events uh i, I think that's been my experience anyway brendan yeah uh, it is the experience it is happening uh it's happening in general the collective is becoming more open testing teams are uh sort of working together more often mm -hmm. um yeah, there, there's definitely one one testing team that exists that's more secretive than the others, but that's because there's a hundred people on it, um, so they they don't really need to work with anybody else. But yeah, I mean, what happens nowadays? Like when we were in Barcelona, you know, we're in the testing house, and then you know, Alex Vore just like comes over and comes in. I mean, that I mean that that probably sounds normal, but I'll tell you, like two years ago, that would have been very abnormal, right? It's like yeah. you just have someone from another team just come in and immediately they you just cross pollinate all the information. But because people are so good. And because, I mean, just in general, people are so good at flesh and blood, you're not losing, You're in general, you're not losing edge when sharing information mm -hmm. and trading information with people. You're actually just gaining a different perspective and you're collectively yeah. getting better. I know that there might be like a, like a, like an, like a weird, like ethical argument here of like, should you just be sharing no matter what? The, the categorical imperative here is that in general, nowadays, you will only get better from this. Where in the past, that was definitely not the case. In the past, you could def like there were some testing teams that were way ahead of others, and there was a reason to be siloed because you could come to an event um, much more prepared than other yep. people. I think that nowadays you go to the World Championship, eighty percent, ninety percent of those players are ultra prepared. They know what they're doing. So I don't know. It's it's also just a way better environment. I love it. It's it was uh, Barcelona was my favorite testing experience so far. Yeah, I mean, I hundred percent agree. I think 
you know in the past people come with these decks that were like out of the box and, and people sort of do that to a degree but like often getting other people's opinions on that isn't the end of the world and like if a list you know gets spread or people like oh this is exciting or whatever there's so much of there's so many of the the lists going around right we have the deck like every every team kind of feels that to a degree so like honestly like it doesn't change people's preparation or approach much it's like okay cool it's good to know that right that's something to think about but honestly i gotta focus on what i'm doing right here i'm going to talk about that about like what is kind of the nuts and bolts of like where you need to spend your time because my experience this cha world championships was getting spread all over the place and honestly it's actually like you're doing yourself a disservice like it's a negative to start to like take in all the noise from other groups um like don't get me wrong so like information and trading information is great like brendan says but like if you let yourself be super influenced by everything that's happening in, in different group, group a over here group b over here group c over here group d over here you can end up in a, a very messy situation which we'll we'll kind of talk about but the the us the other thing i wanted to add on was like in the past right you talked about alex coming into your group and, and testing like in the past i probably wouldn't have stayed with you guys right like uh, it, it just wouldn't have worked if you guys were wanting to to keep information and things like that because ultimately like i wasn't working with you guys but i was staying in the airbnb so that could have been you know conflict of interest previously but i think like you say people are you know like it came in and like one of the first questions that like um caleb asked me was like about like an icelander question about the drama matchup and i was like yeah like this is how i feel about it this is my experience so far happy to share um and likewise you know so was caleb so yeah it's a very yeah. different dynamic to i think what we've seen in the past yeah and at, at that level debatably anyway. it might have been just optimal the entire life cycle of flesh and yeah blood. probably like it, like that's the thing is like it, i think it's like a part of it is like a bit of like an immaturity to card games it's like when you first start really competing you feel like you gotta like keep like your your secrets keep your keep your sauce but the thing is is like once people are good everybody's got that sauce <laughs> and the sauce only gets better when you sort of work with other people um so yeah i mean this is the most open testing process and group that we've like uh that we've ever had and i thought it worked really well everybody got shit on at the tournament but i felt great about that i felt great about the prep and so did everybody else like honestly everybody felt great even though it didn't pan out i mean like I said last week, Tom Dowling said something that resonated with me, which is tournaments are designed to create losers. Unfortunately, this time it just wasn't their day. So, uh, yeah, but the process, we we're happy with it. Yeah, Tom liked that you gave him a shout out. So stop giving him a shout oh, out. Oh, shit. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just want to preface kind of this main topic with the fact that the face of testing teams is changing in flesh and blood. And and of course, we're talking at a, at the highest level, right? At the, at the pro level, at the world championships, the pro tours. But if you are an aspiring pro player you know you're you're a grinder out there you're looking to punch your invite for amsterdam maybe you're on your way to la it's gonna be your first pro tour or maybe it's not your second third pro tour whatever it is like i think what we're going to discuss in this main topic can go down to any level whether that's you know the level of of pro quest grinder whether it's the level of someone traveling for calling whether it's the level of someone going to the first pro tour whether it's you know the experiences that we've got at the kind of continual uh, pro level right so all right I want to want to talk about what makes an effective testing group now that we've kind of prefaced all that. And I think you kind of alluded to this, but the, the one top of my list, Brendan, has got to be like a common goal. Hmm. I think if you're, if you're sitting up a testing group, uh, no matter it be two people, you know, like you talked about, I still think there's effectiveness in, in two people testing groups. I think there's effectiveness in three and four people testing groups. You know, maybe you've got a 70 person testing group, like some teams out there. I think, you know, maybe there's a middle ground and then, on and that. Then you, and then you play Bravo at the World Chain. I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, it did much better than uh, any of us did. So. True. Um, Michael Hamilton's built different, though. We all know that. Uh, yeah, so you have you have this guy. I mean, Brody played Dash IO, which is freaking awesome, by the way. So shout out to, to Brody making that decision. You know, like, also the other thing, we'll talk about this, but a testing group doesn't have to play the same deck, right? Like, you, you're testing as a group to get that information. Obviously, we're talking about a common goal here, right? And, you know, getting concentrated on your efforts especially towards the end of testing to make sure you hone in on game plans which we we'll talk about is really important but everyone might not agree right and you might especially if your group's bigger you might find that you have splinter groups which is is, is, is not the end of the world but i think number one it's got to be like you've got to have a common goal and when it comes to a common goal like this is our common goal is we want to prepare for x event or we want to get ourselves to qualify for the pro tour via this pro quest season you know like those those are the common goals right because once you set that benchmark of what you want to work towards everyone's on the same page we know what we're going towards we're not sort of saying well you know oh the goal wasn't really clear i thought we we're just testing for like mm. the first week of pro quest and then i'm out sort yeah. of thing it's like no we're testing to get everyone qualified so that means that maybe you qualified in week one but we've got to keep working to get everyone qualified through through weeks two and three common goals are like i mean everybody being on the same page in terms of like what is trying to be accomplished and the effort 
that needs to be put in by each individual is like the key to success in general. Like all of us have worked, most of us listening, I mean, there's maybe some younger, younger bloods listening to this, but most of us have worked in like a company, or like on a project. And you have those people that are like, you know, everybody's got like the same contract or right? everybody has like the same kind of role, but some people work Do school projects. Yeah. Some people school work projects. harder and then some people don't, don't work as hard. And then it just, it just feels like, sh- and like everybody kind of feels yeah. weird about it. Like the person working too hard feels like they're getting screwed over. The person not working hard enough is like, why, like, why is this person like going like too far out of the way? Like we have like, we have four months to finish this. Why are they being annoying and trying to finish it in a week? It's like, it's way better to just go from the, the sort of genesis of it and be like, we are literally, we are preparing for this tournament. Our goal is to do this at this tournament and we're going to implement these testing days, these testing times, and here's all of our KPIs. Like, yeah, I, I think that we're a bit more corporate about our testing than like any other group out there. Maybe not in Barcelona, but yeah, maybe not any, but in general, <laughs> it's, it's because like when you don't set these like really definable metrics of like what exactly you're trying to do what is it what what ends up happening is like nothing fucking happens and like it's terrible because like people don't hop on for testing that they could do seriously they skip this day they skip that day you didn't cover that matchup you didn't work on like game plans and then you're there four days before the tournament trying to do all the testing and it sucks Mm -hmm. so um yeah i think getting everybody aligned that wants to achieve a similar goal and then setting up like a schedule and in terms of like how you're going to do that with actionable items that's how you become successful. Yeah. Next up, in terms of uh, making an effective testing group, I think open communication. Now, we're not talking about the communication we talked about previously, you know, between group. We're talking about intergroup, you know, um, communication. So, talking about group, communication within the group, sorry. So, I think this is, is really important. Like, you've got to be open to, to receiving feedback. You've got to be open to giving feedback. And that comes into, like, playing the games, uh, looking at the decks that you're looking to test, et cetera. So like, you know, if you're sat there and someone's like, oh, hey, you know, me and say there's five people in the group and it's like me, Bob, Jim and Phil, right? And it's like, okay, me and Phil, we're going to go off and play this matchup. Jim and Bob, you're going to play this matchup. And then we come back and we give our findings. And then you're like, ah, someone's like, nah, like you're just wrong. I played the matchup and that's not how it goes. It's like, this is not effective communication, right? It's like, you can disagree with it. It's like, hey, okay, that, that, that contradicts what I found when we played that matchup last week. Cool. Okay. We're going to, we're going to swap over. Jim, you're going to play against Phil and you're going to find out whether that's like true. Let's like, let's v- validate the findings that we just found, for instance. But you've got to have open communication within the group to talk about, you know, like, hey, this is what I'm finding. This is what I'm seeing. And it kind of comes down to like trust as well. Like you've got to trust in each other. Like, yeah, we're doing this. We're not doing this. Um, you know, being able to, question and ask hey did you guys try this did you try this hey do you mind if i jump in on this game with you and like watch and you know we'll communicate together on what we see is happening in this game but like you've got to be open to be able to like give feedback receive feedback and communicate on like what's happening through your testing process that happens all the time half the team thinks that that (laughs) happens half the team thinks the the matchup's unwinnable half the team thinks it's unlosable it's like crazy um you just have to validate the findings luckily in flesh and blood or in card games in general the findings can the result that you're trying to achieve can be relatively objective it's not subjective um the issue is like before you actually test it it is subjective but because we're yeah. trying to reach an objective result this these like gamer egos which is like the worst shit ever it sucks it doesn't really happen in flesh and blood because you can just test it and if they're wrong they're probably going to lose like it's probably going to become pretty apparent but the problem is is like sometimes when people get like attached to this idea that how they think the matchup plays out or how they think this works is is the truth you don't have to go spend two three hours just like proving that wrong when if they were maybe a bit more receptive to all the other day that was being aggregated by the testing team mm-hmm. you could sort of nip that opinion in the butt because it's it's just wrong um so that, that happens a lot to be honest that that, that really does happen a lot it's it, it's actually crazy it, it's a phenomenon that you know some people can be so split <laughs> on so, like and i mean Half the team thinks it's ninety ten. Half the team thinks it's ninety ten the other way, and you're like, "What is going yeah. on here?" <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's like it's sometimes it's a bit of a paradox though, because it does come down to deck builds and game plans, and it's like, "Yeah, this is," and you know, it's like, "Oh, this matchup sixty forty, and then it's like it might be sixty forty with if your opponent plays that game plan and we play this game plan, but actually it could be thirty seventy if if they play this game plan. So, or they have these cards prepared for us. So, it's not completely black and white. Like it can be really fluid, but I, I do agree. Often you can. You can usually work out where you should or shouldn't be just by validating the kind of results uh, and the game plans. Um, And we'll talk about kind of inbred game plans a little bit later on. Um, 
I think the next part for me, Brennan, is like, for the most part, and most of the time, leave the bruise at the door. Mm. That's going to make it a bit. It, it's, it's really hard. If everyone comes into a testing group and everyone's got their, like, their pet deck or their bruise they want to work on, it's going to be really tough to combine your efforts, work together, and, uh, and get to, I guess, this, the end point in your common goal if everyone's like creating noise effectively. Like, yeah, a brew might be the right approach this time, but honestly, 90% of the time, it ain't worth it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's something that I said in our testing channel, almost out of ignorance and arrogance at the beginning. As I said, Dramai is the best deck. You all literally need to be Dramai experts by the time you show up in Barcelona. Was everybody playing Dramai at that point? Was Dramai actually the best deck? No, but it, and that was like it was just because really what I was trying to say is stop the BS with this like with, stop with this like this combo deck that combo deck stop with the you know the Reinar stuff like first try to be good on the actual deck that's like we think is the best because mm. you don't want to save that to the to the, the evening before you're trying to now be a master of Jermai and have the best deck list. It's like let's establish our baseline first, and then if we have extra time. We can we can bring in some brews, you know. We can bring in some brews if we really if we understand the metagame. It's just like sometimes in the past we've gotten so distracted by these bad decks that we just wasted way too much time. We didn't actually play the good decks enough, and it was not good. It was not good. Yeah, I mean, can definitely give some examples. I think we're, we're going to discuss some kind of examples of testing groups in a second, and I have a good example of exactly just that. But look, sometimes there's going to be correct, right? It's going to be correct. It's like, hey, someone comes in. I got this really powerful strategy that I found. Um, can we spend a day validating it? Can we, you know, there's four of us. Can two people jump on the deck? Um, maybe the two people who know the deck the best or kind of understand it the best. And let's like validate this against the two or three best decks in the format and see if this is valid. Because you can spend a day doing that. And it's like, okay, if we're getting good results against two of these three decks or all three of them, like this is something we should pursue and spend at least another couple of days continuing to validate. And if you know what, if it's, if it's not working out and it's not as powerful as you thought, or it's easily counterable, uh, whatever it is, then let's shelve it and move on. We've spent only a day. That's not the end of the world, but you've got to be really pragmatic about it. If you get a week down the line, it's like, oh, actually, this isn't quite what we thought because we didn't validate the results in the right way. Like we kind of just went with theory. We went with like, this does this and this does this. And all of a sudden it's like, actually, no, it doesn't do any of those things that we thought. We spent a week on it. Like I can use an example, right? Let's say something like uh, Max in this current format, right? It's like, okay, Max was a very powerful strategy. And you test it into like Bravo and Iceland. It's like, hey, this is pretty good, right? But if you didn't validate your results against Dramai and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, yeah, in theory, it's good. And then you get like a week down the track after you've spent a lot of testing time on like Icelander and Bravo. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, let's go to Dramai. And the Dramai matchup sucks. Then, and you're not going to play it because of that. Like you, you've kind of wasted your time, right? And that, not exactly what happened in, to us in this, in this instance. It was a little bit more iterative, which we'll talk about. But, well, yeah. you know, us you can, you can spread that example man. to whatever. <laughs> if I could like talk, if you spend if, all your time playing it's Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> if I could talk a little shit this time. Um internally, so Hayden wasn't testing with us, he was testing with uh Nick, Matt, stuff like so he's completely separate. Uh I remember Hayden he, we have a group chat and Hayden's like, yeah, he's like, oh, I'm not playing I'm playing this other deck. He didn't tell me the deck, didn't tell me the deck. I had no idea the deck was. Hayden lands in Barcelona, the first thing I say to him is like, I I guarantee you're playing Jermaine. He said, No chance. I'll play Dash of anything. He's like, but we have the deck. We're asking the question. He's like super confident. I'm like, I know he's not playing this fucking deck now because it's some weird deck. It's some weird deck. And even I I literally I'm 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 casting the tournament, right? So I, I have this thing called the the purple pox thing. I pull up round one pairings, you know what I see? Hayden, Dromai. Dromai V Fi. <laughs> Hayden, talk to me about why that happened. Why why was why was I right? Did I just get lucky? Um, I talked about this a little bit last week. Look, ultimately, I think the deck I should have played was Dash. It's the deck I had tested the most. Mm -hmm. It's the deck I had the reps with. Um, I should have spent my last week. This is reflective, right? We can reflect on World Championship. <laughs> but I should have spent my last week with what I... I, I knew the meta. I, like, the meta was exactly, basically, almost what I, I thought mm -hmm. it would be. I, you know, a little bit more Iceland than we thought. But at one point in, in the weeks leading up to it, we thought Iceland was going to be really popular. We thought it might be even number one. So the meta was kind of known. Uh, the matchups I felt against the top three decks were, were pretty good. But I, I got this like kind of doubt in my head. And Nick came with the max deck, which I thought was super exciting. And I always want to play something atypical I can, right? I want to play something that is different, that's exciting, that's fun, that's powerful, that catches people off guard. Because people not knowing a strategy is a powerful place to be. But the deck also needs to be in a really good place just in general. And I think instead of spending my last week just really honing in the dash matchups and working on the things, like I felt like I was like, 
pretty close to like 50. I, I, I was not losing to Droma in testing, mm-hmm. but other people were with Dash. And that definitely planted seeds of doubt. But I need to back myself as like my reflection on that. Yes, the testing group and the information we're finding is great, but I was beating during my now testing. So, and then, you know, I felt really good against Bravo. That felt, match felt amazing. I felt good against Icelander as well. Like I thought like I had the list built to play into Icelander as well. So I felt really good about those. I should have just spent the last week. I should have played um, Dash. Dromai ended up just being the comfort pick because I didn't do that in the last week. I didn't feel comfortable enough in Max and feel like I had enough time and ran out of time on the last day and decided I needed to audible and ended up going to Aaron Chance's drummy list. You know, again, shout out to Aaron for for hooking me up with the list and a great list, but I wasn't prepared to play the list in the way that it was built and ultimately got super punished. So really, yes, you're right. I ended up on Dromai. I should have been playing Dash, uh, but probably Dromai is the third deck I should have played. I should have probably played Nax before Dromai as well. Yeah. I mean, honestly, at that point, it's like, should you just play that? I mean, Chris, it's Chris and I only almost top eight with Max. I don't know if you got the all yeah. lists were similar, but- um, I think he top, he cashed, right? Top 32? Yeah. Yeah, it was either like top thirty two or like he like top he got like seventeenth or something. I think he was like just out yeah. of like some cash, like some I think he had some different thoughts to us apparently. I haven't he posted up a video or someone interviewed him posted up a video. I haven't seen it yet, but I had heard that he had some pretty different thoughts to what a Nick and Matt had on Max and Oh yeah, yeah I know who posted the video actually. It's um uh i'll check it out yeah it's, I'll check it's it out. wrestling right like uh, i think it's oh was it i think so i, I think so okay, cool, i think cool. so i think so i think so i think so i think so i'm gonna get i'm gonna get in so much trouble if i get that wrong i think you might be right i think you might be right mm. all right let's uh in terms of effective testing groups now that you've roasted me about playing dromai <laughs> do you want to talk about you know we've been in testing groups we've been in the same testing group and different testing groups we've been in testing groups of different sizes we've been in testing groups where we've kind you know we've been in the same wider testing group but we've not tested with each other for instance what examples for you of like effective testing groups that you've been a part of mm, so for me what works for me uh is kind of what i sp- spoke to earlier is a testing group that defines a goal um is very like-minded in the goal like for instance you get gives me like everybody wants to win this tournament like i don't really want to play i don't really want to play in like a group i mean it's different you know if everybody was willing to commit to the schedule but i wouldn't really want to play in a group where like you know we have five out of six players want to win the tournament and then the sixth player wants to top 100 or something it's just like it's it's kind of misaligned and but if they commit to the same effort and they're willing to put in the work actually player skill player skill is probably one of the least relevant things in a testing group it's more about work ethic um not having an ego and yeah i mean all that kind of stuff so for me um the most the most important thing that was the question right what's the most important thing or i kind of got no 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 examples of effective testing groups examples of effect- oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i got so lost there for a sec <laughs> um examples of effective testing groups like i can start if you want so like i think you know one of the more effective ones for me was a, a different kind of working so worlds 2022 mm. we worked with about six people including sasha um gabe mike uh, from canada dan who's all, always in my testing sphere somewhere even if he's not directly involved in the group he'll be he'll be there to help me test um and that was quite that the communication was really yeah, good was for that event. So too. everyone was te- yeah, everyone was testing daily. The information, like people were really pragmatic about the testing and what they were trying, and people were going through like phases and steps of testing. And it was really, really effective, I think. Um the other one the other one for me, everyone played Kano in that class constructed, everyone played Icelander and, and the Blitz. Um the other one for me is like calling Singapore, where this was a very this is a smaller testing. This was basically for myself anyway, just me and Nick and Dan doing a little bit of testing with me as well. So like a you know, and then I know Nick and Matt were testing a little bit. It's so like a three to four person kind of wider testing group, but really a, a two person sort of group. Um, locking in a deck early and just testing matchups, like being like, hey, this is the most powerful thing. Let's just test all the matchups, get the right list and, and kind of nail it down and learn to play the deck. And those are probably two examples of me. It's like, okay, a bigger group of like seven to eight people and then a smaller group of like two to three people. And just, yeah, I, I, I yeah. think... So, I've not had experiences with with massive groups personally, and I, I'm I'm sure they work, but that's something that I'd be interested to look at in the future, potentially. Mm-hmm. Potentially. Um, so the reason why I think that that world's testing group uh, set itself outside of the pack from the other testing groups is because um, one of the biggest issues that most of these because that group was, I mean, the core of that group had been together for a long time, right? But the key issue that we had had in the past, in my opinion, was we hadn't really elected a leader. And it, it sounds romantic to be the leader of a testing group, but it actually just sucks. <laughs> it's terrible in every single way. But somebody has to do it. Somebody has to sort of pioneer or at least spearhead like the schedule 
what we're trying to achieve on the mac- macro level and making sure we're, we're, we're actually hitting like our, our sort of cadence in terms of like, we need to have the deck selected by this date. We need to have the matchups done by this date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for that tested group, we, I literally told Sasha, I was like, because I wasn't playing. So like, I knew I was casting and I was going to test a lot, but I should not be the leader of this group in this one. Cause like, I'm not as invested as you guys. I told Sasha, I was like, you just do this. Like, just do it. It's the only way it's going to work. And because like, I feel like to an extent, and I'm going to reuse this word from previous podcasts that the, the leader of a testing group has to be somewhat tyrannical, right? They have to hold people to a very, very, very tight schedule and to just discipline, right? And that's extremely important because as soon as you kind of let go a little bit, you know, you're like, oh, let's get this day, let's get that day, we'll neglect that matchup. It just kind of all goes to shit. <laughs> it really does. And when you have one person that's really in the driver's seat and is making sure that you're hitting those macro goals, because the micro is the gameplay, right? And the individual games from people, the discussion, but the macro stuff and making sure you're doing it at a proper cadence to actually be prepared for the tournament. So important. I feel like that that's why that testing group went really well, because I pulled saw I was like, just do this. And he, he did. And he took ownership and we were prepared that and usually, you know, other times before we would get there, you know, even the tournament, we're still selecting a deck and it's, yeah, it wasn't like that this time. Never. I mean, I said after Lille, never again. And obviously I did it at Worlds, but Worlds is, this Worlds is an exception. Like I didn't get to play in the lead up to the event. So it's a little bit different, but mm-hmm. anyway, I digress. Um, let's talk about a question that's going to be really important to this for a lot of people, which is how to put the players together. Who should the players be? What level of player do I need? So. I think, you know, for me, Brent, it's really going to depend on the event. Um, I think you want players that are going to play at the event. I think that's the ideal. I would say I've been an exception to this a little bit with how Dan's involved, been involved in our testing. You know, shout out to Dan. He's one of the, I will say it again, one of the best play testers in, in the world. Um, he also just won a battle heart recently. So nice, nice going, Dan. Um, and he's always down to play, always willing to, he's got a process. He wants to play, he wants to play with process, but it's, it's so rare to find that player, I think. Um, and so I think you want players in your group like you said, common goal. And while that common goal is players are going to be playing the same event. So let's say you're, you're, you're ProQuest, you wanna, you've got ProQuest coming up, you want to qualify for ProQuest, let's find three or four players, two or three players, whatever it is that all want to win their ProQuest, all want to qualify for the Pro Tour, and let's work together. And let's, you know, let's, maybe it's your locals, right? So maybe you go and find a couple of players locally, you just one, you're like, ah, oh, there's this person at my locals, they're, they're good. I've never really spoken to them. I know they're good. Why don't I just reach out to them and say, hey, do you want to do a bit of testing? Let's, uh, the next four weeks, every weekend for the Saturday, Sunday in the mornings, let's test. Or maybe we can jump on Talashar or TCS or whatever, two nights a week and we do. Let's put a schedule together. Let's do it. Maybe locally isn't going to work out. Maybe you don't feel like you have the players. Reach out on Discord, find some players through your connections, maybe it's on Facebook, whatever. Just get a couple of players like-minded who are going to be doing the same, achieve, trying to achieve the same goal and, and go from there. And that's the same at the calling level, it's the same at the Pro Tour level. Uh, you know, that's how, how you talked about Worlds last year in that effective testing group. I mean, that's partly how they came about. Like Mike and Gabe uh, came through via Dante, right? It's like, well, these guys are like-minded. They're going to be at the Pro Tour. They want to win the Pro Tour as well. They want to win Worlds. So let's bring them in and um, we've all got the same common goal and the same, we're going to play the same event. Done, right? Yeah, I, I think the main thing that I want to mention um, as a sub point is that I think that player skill is actually one of the least relevant things. And I think that, you know, the the sort of earlier you, earlier you are in your journey, the more weight you're going to put onto that, where it's like, oh, I need these yeah. players that have top 32 of these events or top 8 at event. And it's like, there's like some sort of qualification to get there. Actually, the least relevant. Like, obviously, you need to be able to play the game. You need to be able to think critically. And ideally, if you performed in the past, that would be great. Yeah, you'll be good. Yeah, you want to be good. But... <laughs> honestly the worst thing that you can have is someone with a freaking ego in a card game it'd be it's terrible it is so uh not conducive to progress and actually finding the objectively correct answers for me it's just people who are willing to commit to the time and are clear about what the schedule is clear about what the goal is and will not deviate from that people that are disciplined because you can make a good player out of almost anyone but if you get someone in there that's got, you know, some sort of ego, lazy yeah, ego some, whatever. it's really the ego thing. Like if you got some dumbass <laughs> who just like thinks that they, you know, they know everything and that th- their ideas of how matchups works are just things that things don't need to be tested. And they're also lazy because of that. Like those are the worst people. And I don't care if that person's top 32 in an event. I really, I don't care if they've won an event. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like discipline and sort of the rigidity of a schedule and a common goal is the most important thing by far. Um, yeah, I mean, 
that that's really it for me. And people that can, people that can, are, oh, be, and this comes with the ego, but people have to be very, very open to being wrong. Like it's just super important because most people are wrong most of the time. Even the best players in the world, they're wrong. Um, and they, yeah. they the process, the, it's an iterative process. Literally testing for an event is an iterative, is an iterative, iterative process of being wrong over and over and over again until you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a decision tree, right? And you're gonna go down the wrong path sometimes. You're gonna be wrong. You know, come back it back up. You get on the next path. See if you're right. Yeah, I, I I put this in the notes, right? And it's like there is a difference between a good player and a good tester, and yeah. a good player does not guarantee a good play testing partner. And how do you know? Well, you don't know, right? Like you can't know at face value. But there's some like things gonna tip you off, right? It's like if someone's gonna not be able to commit to times that you want to do like is that the right fit for you so i think you just be really clear up front right about again just going back to that common goal if you're going to find players to play test with or build a testing you want to start to build an effective testing group you've just got to all be on the same page and you've just got to make sure they're gonna be the right fit and look honestly sometimes it's like hey let's work together for this event let's see how it goes and it's like you know what hey let's being we're being perfectly honest here didn't work out didn't feel like we were getting both both sides getting what we needed let's let's part ways and next time i'm gonna try and test someone else or i'm gonna try and reach out to another group or whatever it is like Mm -hmm. you've got to be a little bit selfish sometimes when it comes to testing but for the greater good i would say um yeah i want to i want to speak about one thing that i don't have experience with but i know exists and i know is probably a part of the journey to finding a good testing group in modern flesh and blood and that's i think i believe and i have good this i have good information on this relatively good i believe that nowadays in modern fab that there's a digital client basically and people exist so there are so many good players that exist in discord i know that there are a lot of like testing discords that people get into Mm -hmm. and they get exposed to good players and good testers through that those discords i don't believe are like immediately publicly available but i do what i'm trying to say is there is some sort of like discord grind i think that goes behind a lot of these players and these testing groups now i don't do it um i usually just test with people that are kind of my friends now and like that's just how it's been my testing group has been pretty pretty much the same but from what i understand those exist so if you're coming from like literally you're on the local scene or maybe you don't even have a locals and you want that's i think you got to look towards discord and just kind of climb whatever ladder there is there to cross pollinate with good players yeah it's so tough like there's no one right way to build an effective testing group or to become part of an effective testing group like for me this is kind of non-negotiable is that I want to have some rapport with the people that I'm testing with. And like, if, you know, they don't need to be my best friends, they don't need to be my friends necessarily, but like, if I don't get along with them, honestly, like I, uh, you know, I don't see eye to eye with them on, um, you know, maybe kind of <laughs> uh, how we operate as human beings. Like, I just don't want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? So it's like, it is tough, I think. And maybe some people might feel differently, right? Like your end goal might over, you know, for me, like fab now is not just a purely competitive play and it hasn't been for a long time. It's also about the social aspect of it for me as well. And about the fulfillment I get from the actual testing. Like I want to trust the process, you know, trust the process is one of the most important things. Brendan just talked about that before, right? The process is more important than necessarily the people or the end outcome if everyone buys into it. Um, But I want part of that process to be, well, I want that process to be enjoyable and I want part of that process to involve people that that mean something to me. So it's a little bit different for everyone. But like, hey, I've built really good friends through testing groups. Like shout out to to Gabe Sher and, and Mike Kronke. Like they've become, you know, like friends of mine through a, a testing group that I had no acquaintance with them beforehand. So um, and now I get to, you know, go to Spain and go and have a, a beer with Gabe, for instance. You know, like it, it is it is great. You can also build friendships through through these testing groups. Mm-hmm. Yep. Agreed with that. Brendan's all right as well, you know. <laughs> I mean, we haven't tested together in a long time. Again, like Hayden said about That's the true. time zone thing, like uh, for some people, like for sometimes you just don't got to force it. Like, especially as you get more people to test with your repertoire, more people are better mm-hmm. at the game. It's like, you know, at this point, there's no reason for Hayden or I to wake up at 5 a.m. some part of the test because that's usually what it looks like or that's what it did in the past and it was Feels. a grind. <laughs> it was a grind. Yeah, it's going to work with your life, right? And that's the thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay, let's talk about uh, any kind of learnings from Worlds. Obviously, you know, you had your learnings. We talked about it. Do you want to recap anything else or anything you heard from other teams? I mean, the mm-hmm. kind of the kind of things I just want to quickly recap is like my learning from Worlds is like my really reflects my learning from Lille and is like kind of reinforces in my mind is that I really need a clear plan for testing process with whatever group I'm working with. Um, I need to make sure I have adequate preparation time and I've kind of planned that preparation time and I think that's huge. So like putting markers in of like, I want this done at this date, I want this done at that date. I'm locking in a deck then. And you know, like it's like, 
there's not really any flexible time on that. It's like, I might go a day over on deciding my deck, but once I've decided, like I'm locking and I'm working on game plans, I'm not ready to flip flop. Like it just, it just isn't worth it in my eyes. Um, and yeah, I think focus of effort was something I learned from Woods as well. Like you can divide and conquer and you should, you should have that trust to divide and conquer on, on matchups and things like that. And then report back and discuss as a, as a group where possible. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, learnings, this is, this is my favorite testing process. Uh, I like the open testing group. I like some of the new the players that we tested with this time that I haven't tested with in the past. I felt like the, the players, especially this time, were very, very humble, as well as being extremely good at the game. Um, and we were able to, I don't know, do a lot of work in a very little time as a result. And I was very pleased with that. Um, the testing itself in terms of like macro was a bit chaotic because it kind of all happened towards the end, but I was casting. So, you know, if, if the people playing the event don't want to have a rigid schedule for two months, go be my Let's guest. Count nice. Not me. <laughs> I'm, I was casting. So, um, but we did a lot of work in those few days and it, I felt, I was really impressed. I was really, really impressed with the players that we did test with. Like generally, genuinely like very, very humble players, very open to being wrong, very objective, and just extremely, extremely good at the game. And yeah, it, it, it was, it was, a, it was a great experience. And I'll probably, probably will at least try to run that back next time, even though the results weren't there. The process, I mean, I couldn't be more pleased with the process. Maybe just a little bit more preparation time. Yeah, I mean, what? <laughs> hey, that's the thing. It's like we're talking. <laughs> It, when, Once you we, get involved, we talk. Well, you talk about the person who's like rigid and wants to like that person tends to kind of be me because like i don't know i just yeah it any other way it just it works it's freaking annoying yeah it's like uh, yeah yeah leal lessons once again hey i'm on board dude i did the same thing again <laughs> yeah, this time and it. you know like that wasn't through that wasn't anything to do with the people i was testing with they were they were actually pretty good it was to do with like me and and my timeline yeah so. i just want to reiterate i think you need, i think i think a testing group needs a leader i think it needs a leader i don't i don't yeah, want I to be right. i don't want to be the fucking leader i don't i don't please don't make me do it i don't want to do it but i i'm just saying this if you have a testing group, I think you need to ha- you need to like actually in a kind of a cringe way decide who's going to do it, decide who's going to lead it, have the vision, keep everybody in check, and someone actually needs to take accountability for that role specifically. Because if you don't, it's just human beings. Like I said, they they miss one here, they miss one there, they don't test that matchup. It's just like and it just degenerates. So you need this one person to <laughs> to just be it, to just be so strict, and it's a shit role. It's it sounds nice and title, but it's a terrible role because you're that no, person. Everyone's got to buy into it. Yeah, and everyone, everyone's going to buy into it as well. So I think it's super important. The best testing process we ever have is because we just, we pick someone and we're like, this is on you. Like everything, ma- it's not fair, right? It's unfair, but it's all on you. You you decide all of the macro things we're going to hit and you guide this group. And it was successful. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the larger the group, the more you need this. I think if you've got two or three people, you can get away mm-hmm. with without that because people, are, they've got the exact same goal. You're like, if I use example nationals 2021 for me, which is the Australian nationals that I won, like I, I worked exclusively with basically with, with Dan and we just, we knew exactly how we wanted to test. We we're on the same page. We we're in the same things. We we're having conversations. It's a two party thing, right? There's a two way conversation going on. Once you had a third voice, a fourth voice, a fifth voice, you get some, you know, you can get some people who can potentially not through fold of their own, but they, maybe they freeload a little bit. Maybe they lean back a little bit. They let others take control. But if there's no clear leader in that instance, then you can get everyone doing that. So. I agree. Let's hit on a few more things before we just kind of wrap up. Um, there's a couple of like really key things that I had in some other sections, which is like what to do when you're testing. One of these, once you're in the actual testing process, we've talked a lot about the actual testing process. If you want to hear more about that, go back and check our, uh, our pod on actual testing and, and strategies and how to effectively test for flesh and blood events. Um, this is about groups. But one of the things I want to say was like be nimble, but don't overcorrect. Um, the silo that is the metagame cons- discussion can really derail a testing process. And example of this is like the lead up to Worlds on Thursday at the banquet. Mm. There were so many people that I talked to like, I don't know what I'm playing. Like, I, yes, I was in the same boat. Like I was like, I haven't locked in. And that honestly is like, that came down to a lot of like, Bravo is going to be the number play deck. No, Drome is the deck to beat. No, actually Icelander on the day before turns out where it sounds like everyone's playing Icelander. Uh, and if you you buy into that discussion and you haven't, you start to deviate from, you know, like you want to be nimble and ad- adapt to like things like maybe a deck comes out. It's like, hey, Dash IO, like we've got to be nimble. And we've got to test this and understand what that matchup looks like. But if we start to like be completely sort of, um, you know, we're letting the, dis- the discussion take over and we're going this way and now we're going that way and then tomorrow we're going that way. Like that is not effective and that is going to ruin your testing process. Agreed. Uh, where should your testing end up? I think most of the time, the testing should end up playing the most inherently powerful deck. 
or you make a, a, a meta selection and tackle a part of the meta game that is dominant with a particular answer. And those are really, honestly, the places you should end up. 80% of the time, play the most powerful deck, the best deck in your eyes and the, the group size, or playing the deck that beats the decks that are at the top of the tables. And outside of that, maybe you've got something super spicy, but that should be like, honestly, like one to 2% of the time. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not 80% of the time. Nope. Like some you should also end up, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should also end up with a really clear set of game plans against eighty percent of the field that matters. And one of my big pieces of advice is like, don't sweat the twenty percent at the risk of not nailing down the top matchup. So if you're sat there being like, you know, with three or four game more games versus Fi, uh, trying a different strategy, be more worthwhile than three or four games versus like Levi and Teclo. Yes, one hundred percent it will be. Like, spend your time on those key matchups. Make sure those are nailed down. And then if you've got time, yeah, you can start to play with like some of the fringe decks and understand your matchups, but like spend your majority of the time where you expect the majority of your matchups to come and make sure those are nailed down before you start. Like don't go through your testing process with your testing group and be like, okay, cool. We've found the deck. Let's start working on game plans. And you know, uh, Jim and Bob over here are like, oh yeah, we're going to test like the matchup until Leviathan. It's like, well, hold up. First of all, we need to understand like the dash matchup. We need to understand the fire matchup. We need to understand the rip icelander matchup whatever um so yeah making sure that the group is really concentrated on the matchups that, that matter and validating those results as well so that you've got the right game plans really to locked and loaded that you're testing mm -hmm. um the last thing is this might sound a little odd but like your win rates probably shouldn't be that high and honestly they kind of don't matter towards the end of your testing like once you've got the deck locked in and you've made a decision based on process and if, uh, what you know about matchups yes like something some information might change around how the other side of the matchup is played but Often testing gets really inbred and, you know, the matchups get siloed and like the, mm. the testing player will adapt. They will adapt. Like your win rate will come down. Yeah. Like I, when we were playing Max into, into uh, Dromai, right? It's like, yes, the matchup is going to continue to come down in percentage points because the Dromai player on the other side is adapting to that game plan. Um, so like, don't be necessarily discouraged. Take a step back and look macro. Like, hey, is this a broader problem about our deck or is this actually down to the person on the other side who's understanding the matchup more and is, is just getting better at the matchup? Yeah. That's sort of ruining our win rate. This reminds me of, uh, it's related to ego, but one of the worst qualities in a testing partner is someone who's trying to win and they should be attempting to win the match but when they are like when i say trying to win it's like they start taking the deck i mean they still like i just they start conceding when the game gets behind it's like the worst shit ever learning first yeah it's learning first always learning learning all the time like yeah. <laughs> there's no read like uh people like they actually You'd be surprised. And I'll give some credence to it. It's hard to get beat down 10 games in a row. Like when you know the game is 90-10, you're like, why the fuck are we testing this? Like you're just losing all the time. You'll see players get irritated and they will get like emotionally invested in, in the losing and they will try to avoid that. It's very not, it's very much not conducive to success, but it happens. And it's, it's honestly, it's one of the most common toxic traits in testing is people trying to win over trying to learn. Dude, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard getting beat down a lot. Yeah. And I can attest. Like, you get sick of that shit. But for the greater good, right? For the greater good of the group. All right. Last one. Play the best deck. Learn it inside out. Uh, learn the game plans. It's always a good place to be. And if that's where your testing group ends up, like you have not failed. Like if you have not found the source, you've not found the spice. If you are on the best deck with the best game plans, that is a success. So just kind of wanted to reiterate that when it comes to building effective testing groups. Yeah. And uh, surprisingly... Don't be too results oriented. Don't be too. I mean, you should use it as a guidance for the future. It's like, did that work out? Did it not? You know, but it's, it shouldn't be the key in sort of, you know, your retrospective when you look back on your testing team and your testing process and your people. If you, if you didn't, if you weren't able to be successful, it doesn't necessarily mean that what you did was wrong. It could just mean that it wasn't your day. Can can you use that as the foundation for like the, I don't know, the impetus of the idea to adapt and maybe tweak some things? Yes, you can. And that's 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 learning. That's being smart. But if you're one of these people that doesn't do well at a tournament and immediately tries to scrap everything, reinvent the wheel, find new people, like you might just be on that hamster wheel a little bit too much. And like sometimes at these tournaments, you will do everything correct and you will still lose. That's just what happens. Mm -hmm. Hey. What did Tom Dowling say? Yeah, I know. I was trying not to say his name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for this episode on how to build affecting, uh, how to build a successful and effective testing teams. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, if you're out there and you're looking to, you know, you're thinking, hey, I want to take the next step in flesh and blood, that probably involves a testing group. Like, there's no right or wrong way to build a testing group or to become a part of a testing group but you know like it is super beneficial and just I think it's about finding the right fit and all the things that we talked about. Um, so, 
yeah, I don't know. Anything else to top it off, Brendan, before we close it out? I'll let you let you take it out otherwise. You'd be surprised how an inaccurate Talishar data can be. Nah, You'd be cool. surprised. <laughs> You'd be surprised. It's, um, I mean, it's happened to us many times now at this point, now that that client has been invented. But, you know, I wouldn't take, put too much weight on Talishar data. Um, like we've had decks that have had 90, you know, 80, 90% win rates on Talishar, <laughs> and then we bring them into testing, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, and that's just how it goes. I just want to warn against that because I think a lot of people will, either you look at the, the, the aggregated data on Palishar and you use that as guidance, which I wouldn't do that. Um, or you use your personal play. Well, so maybe you played like 10 games this deck on Palishar and you're destroying everybody. You'd be surprised mm-hmm. what f- world class players can do on the opposing deck. And I, I mean, for instance, it happened this time. I think Bravo is fatigue. Bravo is really poorly positioned into Jermai. Um, especially it's if the terrible. yeah, especially if the Jermai deck is teched for it. But I did watch. I mean, Peter Budensack expertly, as expertly as you can play a defensive uh, Bravo strategy. I mean, second cycle pitch stack like you know perfect cripplings, and it's not that complicated. In the lined up the stages for the ghostly touch, you'd be surprised what world class players can do even in a dog matchup. And um, yeah, I mean, if we had just looked at Talishar, just looked at the data, even with like me on that deck, we would have said hundred zero. But it wasn't. Was it enough to change any strategy? No, but it's relevant that it's actually losable if you don't play well enough, or if you do, you're a little bit unlucky. And um, yeah, it was just it was honestly one of those, one of my. One of my key moments of the testing process was watching Peter, Peter do that because, mm. yeah, I mean, previously I would have said it was unwinnable for Bravo, but he really showed a lot of play skill to actually win that matchup. Be nimble, take on information, but uh, don't overcorrect, right? Mm-hmm. All right, take us out. All right. Well, if you listen to this podcast, you enjoy it. Number one thing you can do is leave us a review. You can do it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps a lot, I promise more than you think uh, we're on youtube at youtube.com slash arsenal pass hit that subscribe while you're there twitter brendan apg fian underscore dale thank you so much to all the arsenal pass patrons and thank you all so much for listening we'll see you next week